Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Ruben Fenter. I am uh, the organizer, and with me is our presenter, uh, Robbie Webb. I'm sure you can all see us. He shared his uh, webcam already, Robbie. We can see you, but yeah. going to hand over to you now. All right, so I just want to quickly run through uh, some of the technical things just before we get started. So first of all, please ensure that you have a stable internet connection throughout the webinar. But if you happen to be disconnected at any time, no worries. You just log on exactly the same way as what you did now, and we'll still be uh, going on with the webinar. All right, at the end, there is a quick survey. It's just three short questions. I urge you to please fill that in for us. Uh, that just helps us improve our services towards you. Then when it comes to your microphones and webcams, please note they are switched off so we cannot see you or hear you. And the way you communicate with us is through the questions tab. All right, next up we have your user interface. So firstly, this orange button is just to hide and unhide. Next up we have the speaker. And as I said, that is muted. So you don't have to worry about that. Then we get to the raising of your hand button. Now this button is typically used just by the presenter if he wants a bit of audience interaction, then he'll ask a question and he asks, please raise your hand, then this is how you do it. You just click that button and it'll your hand will be raised. Okay, for today we don't have any handouts, so we can skip over this one. And then we get to the questions tab. So this is how you communicate with us. Uh, so what you do is you type your question in here and you press send. That question then comes through directly to me. I'll then take notes of it and bring it up with uh, Robbie at the end of this session for a QA. and a All right, now before I hand over to Robbie, there's just a few quick polls. Uh, it's just three questions that we just quickly want to ask uh, just to the audience, just to get a bit of, of feedback. So I'm going to launch it now. Also, it's just a yes, no, or unsure question, but if you have any remarks that you would like to communicate to Robbie, Excuse me. If you have any remarks that you'd like to communicate to Rob, you can see his email is on the screen. So feel free to, um, yeah, to email him. Don't worry, he did give me permission to put his email up. All right, so I'm going to start the first poll now. All right, there we go. So the question is, do you anticipate a surge of plumbing work relating to medical needs or water supply in needy, I assume it means in needy areas? Sorry if that last word is cut off. Um, so yeah, just choose yes, no, or unsure. Okay, so there's three, so I'm not going to keep the poll up for very long. So yeah, another 10 seconds, just select any one of the three options, and then I'll put the next one on. All right, thanks. I see those votes coming in, and uh, there we go. All right, that was the first one. Next one. All right, there, it's up now. <clears throat> Do you have existing construction or new build projects which are likely to resume within the next two months? All right, so you just click on one of the options, uh, yes, no, or unsure. All right, oh nice, I see those votes are coming in quite quickly. Okay, I'm gonna keep it open another 10 seconds. Just select, just click either on the yes, the no, or the unsure. Don't worry, I'm going to show Robbie's email again at the end of this, if you missed it. Right, and now the last one. There we go. Do you anticipate supply chain issues for product procurement? Okay. All right, I see the notes coming in as well. Okay, just the yes, no, or unsure. Okay. Thanks for all those votes coming in. I'm keeping it open another 10 seconds. So uh, just quickly, if you haven't voted, just select one of the three options. All right. Okay, there we go. Um, that's it for the polls. Just another reminder, there is Robbie's email. It's robbie.web at lixel.com. And yeah, I think now it's time to get us started. Robbie, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Ruben, first of all, thanks very much for setting everything up. As I said to you earlier, I feel a bit like the newsreader. It's a little bit intimidating for me for the first one. Anyway, I'll give it a good go. I also want to thank uh, Brendan and the IOPSA guys for 
uh, for the opportunity to do it. And hopefully we can do some more as get a little bit more relaxed and into it. So the, the topic today, I'm going to give really a broad overview on uh, electronic uh, really? product. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I just see your screen isn't up yet. So we can see your webcam. Just make sure you sh you're showing your screen as well. Okay. Can you see that? I haven't started the presentation. Oh, so yeah. I'll... There we go. Uh, yeah. We can see it. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm going to give a broad overview of electronic products which uh f you know for many of you it's not new i know for us we've certainly from my days at castle brass 35 years ago we already had electronic forces i just think it's become um, certainly more needy particularly in these times and um it's not going to be highly technical our, our technical guys victor and the service guys around the country are real specialists on it but it's really a broad overview and at the end, we can have a couple of questions and answers. Uh, last thing before I start the presentation as well, I'm focusing specifically on the Cobratron range, uh, which is a Cobra brand electronic products. We also have Grower, but uh, today I'm going to just focus on the Cobra stuff. Okay, now I stop sharing my camera and I start the presentation. Ruben, is everything looking right so far? Yes, perfect. Yeah, we see your presentation 100%. All right. All right. So just a quick Lixel. I think by now everybody knows that uh, we were we were taken over probably four years ago by now uh, by Lixel, which for us is a really good place to be because it's a it's a massive big manufacturing organization with um, almost infinite resources in terms of technology, expertise, uh, you know, common thinking. So it's those uh, Cobra, the Krugersdorp and the Springs factory, as well as the Vaal factory and Apex, which are which are under Lixel. And um, I think that their view is a long view as a manufacturing business. They're really looking to to grow into Africa. And as opposed to bringing in brands like Grow is within our camp, but they would really develop the Cobra brand as a brand into Africa, as Grow is in Europe and as American standards in, is in America. So they, they, for me, they have tremendously good uh, work ethic and values, and they impart that to us. So you know, these whole doing the right thing, working with respect innovating, experimenting and learn very much what, what we want to do to grow the business. So, uh, yeah. Okay, on to the um, uh, specific uh, talk. So these, can you see the whole screen? I've got my little view panel in here. Uh, yes, Ruben? Robbie, we see the whole screen. Okay, do I, I've got to keep this, this uh, control panel active, huh? Uh, you can press the orange hide button, the orange arrow. Okay, that's better. Then I can, because it, you know, it blocks part of what I'm saying there. <coughs> All right, so um, the, the, as I said earlier, it's an overview. There are, I haven't showed every single product and every single application, but um, I certainly if there are questions afterwards, we can get to it. There's a lot more than what I'm showing here. Oh, no. Okay, so the first thing I think in our particularly here in South Africa, look, there are lots of jobs where they've already got it. It's not new, as I said, but the first perception with many is aren't these things terribly expensive? Um, they are expensive. Obviously, you, you really can't compare a thing which has got all kinds of electronic bits and pieces and components and technology to a, to a normal pillar tap or a flush valve but the point is as professionals as plumbers we really want to be able to offer clients we can do it and the, the choice whether you want to go to that length or spend that kind of money uh, is you, you weigh up the value against the benefits um, I think right now we obviously really heightened about the whole hygiene thing in this coronavirus time and we've had a surge in demand for these things particularly from medical and and um, temporary medical uh, setups that they're going to do 
but I think that going forward, we probably anticipate that that will increase. Um, there have been, just in terms of how reliable and and how long they last, there have been unbelievable um, advances in technology. We partner with so so that we don't make these products uh, in entirety ourselves. To a large degree, we partner with a, with a company in Israel. And uh, they are a world leader in what they do, but we're very much part of their research and development. So certain components we can do, and we do it in-house, uh, things around transformers and some of the brass bits and pieces, but they take feedback from, from our service department, from our manufacturing, and they build it into the product. So many of the things, for example, you would have a toilet flush valve that's electronic, but people don't trust it. So they want to add a mechanical button in as well. So they would develop that product specifically around our South African needs. Um, they, they obviously, there are massive amount of, of good looking products. We try and limit uh, what we keep stock of. Obviously, we can't keep everything because it, it, it's an expensive thing and it really moves around projects. It's not a, it's not a typical DIY off the shelf thing. And I think as a, as a professional, you guys can know that if you specify, use or install these products, we've really, we've really got your back. We know them inside out. We've got a team of 27 guys around the country that can go and either help you install it, explain how they work, fault find it when you get hiccups, major jobs that we've already done, just recently four ways more. And to the point where we trust those products, because you can be nervous and what's going to go wrong with these things that finicky, how long is the power going to last? We've got some really strong, good lasting products. Okay, so just quickly on, on how the, the operation is, and I'm sorry for those who know it, but it's a, 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 just a general um, infrared sensor solenoid system. So what happens is there's a little uh, IC with an infrared eye, which sends out a beam, a little pulse three times in a a second. So every second it sends out three teeny little infrared pulses and once that pulse is interrupted or reflected there's an infrared eye uh, which will receive that reflection back. That reflection then triggers the IC and the IC inside the, the faucet has been programmed to whatever parameters you set. How long before it kicks off, how long it stays active, how long before uh, it, it switches off again. Um, how far it sends the beam out and so on. Then we'll go through that at the end. But it then sends that message down to the solenoid at the bottom there. You can see in the in uh, the, the terminal to the solenoid is at number four. At number five is a little solenoid valve. And that valve then opens the water flow, allows it to flow through, whether it's going to a faucet or a flush valve or a WC. And once the cycle is completed, it then switches it off. Um, the key point I make about a bipolar solenoid is, I think everybody knows how solenoid works is when you when you have a coil around uh, around a metal flux, when you put a charge through it, it creates a magnet, and that would pull the little piston towards it, and it would stick to the magnet. And as long as that current is there, it it keeps it uh, fixed to the magnet. As soon as the current stops, there's there's often a spring which would send it back to the other side. So in this case, what you have is a bipolar solenoid. That means it reverses the polarity. So the, the, the little piston will be sitting against a fixed magnet, holding the seat closed, and you reverse the polarity of that, uh, of that uh, piston. So it repels against the merit and it fixes the magnet on the other side. So the only current you're using is just to change the polarity on the pulse, as opposed to using that current to keep it fixed against the uh, against the magnet for the whole time. So it really, it's absolutely minimum power consumption. All right. Uh, as far as the power supply options go, once again, I just reiterate, I'm not showing them all, but uh, every product works either with a battery or a transformer. And uh, for obvious reasons, uh, it's it's a lot more efficient to have a transformer from AC supply because you don't have to you know, worry about changing batteries every two or three years or however long they last. Um, there are 
a variety, you know, the single three 10 channel a variety of units, you, you would also get them as you can see there where they come with a with an uninterrupted power supply backup. So they've got a, a big capacitor built in there which would carry power for whatever the period is, eight to 12 hours. So that in our case in South Africa, load shedding and that type of thing, these things would still function. Okay, on uh, options for wash tan basins, there are a lot more than what I'm showing here, but these are typical styles. So they're not, you know, they're not completely beautiful like a lot of uh, lever mixes and so on. But they are they are getting more and more attractive. And of of what we've got coming in the in the the next round, there's some actually really good looking products. And if we really start to get some volume going, they also have unbelievable finishes that we can use PVD color coating and so on. So these would be typically used in public ablution areas, wash hand basins. We've all seen them. And um, uh, you've got all with the same functionality, just different body style. That one on the right, the L Joe, in fact, was uh, specifically done for us. I don't know anybody that might remember Joe Ferry, who's our technical manager a few years back. And he was hellbent that that was the style and the look that his architects wanted. So uh, hence the name El Joe. So that was specifically made for him. Okay. You have the option for a, a raised basin mix as well, in case you've got countertop basins. And again, it's not only that one, there are a variety of options. In every style, there is a raised basin mixer. And then you also have a wall mounted so I'll show a little diagram just now. You know, you've seen these things where they, uh, you, it comes out from the wall and you have a big trough type of basin underneath it. We add an option again where you've got that little LED in the front um, where people, you know, it doesn't, it works electronically, but it's not a sensitive because people in some places genuinely don't know what to do. And so that little LED, if you physically touch it, it starts and finishes the cycle. So obviously that that defeats the purpose of being a hands touch free thing. But for some reason, there's a call for it. So it is there. And that that uh, LED or little piezo switch option, again, is available in many products. OK, on the wall mount installation, everything would be behind the wall or under the, under the little slab, as you can see there, transformers and the control box. Uh, and the only thing which is exposed is the spout itself. A point I wanted to make here was um, you have that minimum distance of 300 millimeters from the outlet to the surface. And if it's lower than that, it keeps reflecting straight back and the thing doesn't shut off. And one of the things that we've encountered too often is that on the drawing, they measure that 300 mil on the wall, so from the wall to, to the bottom. And by the time that basin is slanted up, that trough is slanted up, you, you're at 270 or 260 or something, and it's too late now because the tiles have been punched out. And so we've had, I mean, at Artscape in Cape Town, there's a few places where, where the designer, the architect makes that mistake. So just make sure from the outlet to where it's going to, direct that beam to the bottom, it's got to be 300. And that's why I see funny things like these things that turn to the side or they put in skiff because to try and avert that problem because it can't change tiles. Okay. In every uh, style, uh, there is a soap or foam dispenser available as well. Um, and it's, you know, it really looks quite nice. They've in fact now got to the point where they've got a, a, a trio, which we haven't introduced yet. We've got a, a, a basin faucet, a soap dispenser, and a hand dryer, all in the same style, all installed right there at the basin. So you don't walk with your dripping hands across the tiles to another place to go and dry them. The soap dispensers, they've really, in their business, they, they lead the world with it. That's become absolute uh, core business for them because they have bulk things, they have things which are linked up to, to monitoring systems, they can do foam, they've got pumps that can handle an extensive range of viscosities and so on. 
So they really are the, the availability of those things. And I think the demand for them is going to increase. So just so that you know, there is such a thing around. Okay, for, for your rhinals, uh, you'd have typically on the right hand side that EL3004 would be uh, a, a electronic version of, a, of let's say an FJ6000, a good old uh, Cobra urinal valve. It does exact same function, um, you know, and you can, we'll go through the setting parameters just now, but it's an exposed, and you could probably replace many mechanical urinal valves with exactly that product. I haven't showed it in this presentation. We've in fact got a retrofit top where you screw out the top cover uh, and the piston of an FJ6000 and screw in this, this top assembly and that converts without doing any plumbing at all other than changing the, the top, converts your FJ6000 into an electronic product. Okay, there are um, concealed version as well. We'll show the little installation. Once again, you're only seeing a faceplate and uh, all, the, all the workings are behind the wall. And you can obviously only do that where you've got space behind the wall, a duct, that type of thing. Once again, you'd see the EL3006 has got the, the, the little two eyes and a mechanical button as well. And again, people that don't trust the thing or don't know what to do or in the event of a, a power shutdown, that mechanical button would override the electronic function. All right. So on a on a um, exposed version, the only thing that's that's out of the way is the power supply. In our version, we don't have that little uh, plug. We would we would have have it hardwired to a transformer um, because we don't have uh, AC power in bathrooms typically in South Africa. So. Um, and with those transformers, you can do quite a number with the big ones and you have extended low resistance cables. So if you're doing, for example, um, a bunch of toilets or urinals in a toilet block in a shopping center or something like that, you would have one transformer serving up to 10, I think even up to 14 of these units. And um, once again, the, the wiring and setting up, if you've got issues with it, our guys have really got involved with with uh, Mitchell's Plain Hospital, four ways more, big, big projects like that to go and help the plumbers because it is, uh, it's a little bit new still. <clears throat> All right, the, the concealed valve where you're only seeing the face plate and there are, you know, there's a variety of different styles. The box would be pre-plumbed into the wall. So, so before you, while they're still busy with the wet work and before tiling and all that stuff, that box would get plumbed in, and you can see there that you've got a you've got a plaster cover, and that cover obviously you want to try and get your finish distance as close as possible to the tile height, and that's always a bugger for us plumbers because you don't quite know how thick they're going to plaster and what tiles they're going to use and so on, but you've got quite a uh, you can see you can cut that box to suit, so you've got quite a wide tolerance from where you originally fitted to where you end up installing the face plate. And you know, when you get into these things, we could obviously give you much more detailed installation guides and help. Okay, for a toilet, um, and we find that typically they are not, we don't do a lot of toilet valve, lots of faucets and lots of urinals, not so many toilets. People are, um, they they're not very trusting when it comes to a toilet you know they want to flush the thing see it see the stuff get sorted and and uh disposed of you don't want to walk away and leave the cargo there and, and hope something happens so uh toilets less popular than your rhinos at this point but of course we've got an option and in that case again you see they've included a manual override button um okay and then the big one now, medical. I've only showed two here because I was kind of rushing to get my presentation done. <clears throat> but all all of the, the pillar type faucets, the urinal valves, all the electronic products uh, which you would use in all these jobs obviously would still apply in a hospital. And these two specifically would be in 
consulting rooms or surgical scrubs. And um, you would you would see there's an adjustment on the right hand side thermostatic where you could set the temperature. You obviously do that kind of once, and that's that's the comfortable temperature, 38 or, or 40 or whatever you want to set it. And then the rest of it, you would set the parameters with a little remote that I'll show you just now. And you have an option there to have, there are, is it, once again, more than these, but you have an option of a, a spout which comes over the top or one which comes underneath, depending on the, the installation height, and what's going to work for that particular consulting room or, or surgery. Okay, <clears throat> we've got a, a, a project team, Marriott, there's a bunch of guys around the country, and they would uh, specialize in uh, working out what's the right solution for a, uh, for a particular project. So we love to get involved, obviously, because it helps us to specify and sell our products. And um, we really, uh, from your guys' side, if, you, if you're taking something on and you need some help or guidance for that, please get hold of these guys, because we've done lots of them. And they would really know the, the right solution to offer a prison is concealed biases or whatever it is and in domestic or industrial or they've, they've really got a portfolio of work which we've done and uh, and could make good suggestions and then obviously help you put the presentation together when you've got to go and pitch it at your developer or architect or whoever. <clears throat> there are a lot of little accessories and things that go along with these which can help. So. In this case, I've showed a, a, a fairly basic basin, basin faucet, and you're only going to put your hand underneath and water's going to come out. You're not going to adjust temperature like a hot and cold tap. So you may have, a lot of shopping centers would just have cold water. That's typically what we have here. Uh, obviously, in other colder places of the world, that wouldn't work. They've got to have warm water. but. <clears throat> Where you've got to provide warm water, so certainly in hospitals and healthcare places, uh, you would take your your hot and cold into a little blender valve underneath. And again, we have many. Apex makes some. We've got some of these Cobratron ones. Grow makes some. So there's a variety of these things, from basic to more complex. And you pre-blend the water going in. The one on the left, you can see, you can obviously you know set the temperature. It's not calibrated to an exact degrees, but you could set it to where it's comfortable and leave it there. And the, the hot and cold water coming in uh, would be pre-blended and, and comes out of that spout at a warm temperature. Yeah, if you get really complex, we can do flow and return systems where you, where you circulate the water so that you don't have to wait for the uh, hot to get there. Okay, there's a, um, the, each and every one of these products comes with default default factory settings, which are which are in most cases typical and uh, suited to most installation uh, sort of circumstances. But there are a huge number of, of uh, adjustable parameters. So the first, I'll just go through them quickly. So on that remote control, it's, it's a bit like your, <clears throat> yeah, your TV remote. You can sort of see what it's telling you to do on a thing. The detection range would be from how far away you want that valve to recognize that the beam's been interrupted. And <clears throat> that range setting is, uh, as I said, I'm not an expert in these things, but you know, it, it's quite extensive. Um, the next one would be the delay in time. So once the beam has been interrupted, how long do you want it to wait before it sends that pulse to the IC? Should it wait for a second, uh, you know, half a second, three seconds? Because sometimes somebody walking past could trigger it, and you don't want that to happen. So you want to say maybe give it a second. And you guys have seen these things. You put your hand underneath, and it waits a little bit, and then it goes. So you don't want to leave it too long either, because people think it's not working, and they start to fiddle. But uh, so that pre uh, pre delay time can be set, or the delay in time. Then obviously the length. Of the of the cycle, which goes uh, anywhere from one to two thousand six hundred seconds. So I think who wants to wash your hands for two thousand six hundred seconds? But remember that some of these things are used in emergency showers and 
you know, there are other applications. So you've got a very, very wide range of cycle time that you can set and the delay out time you can also set. So once you've taken your hands away, how long before it switches off? Do you want it to just go for another two seconds to, to clear the basin or do you want it to go off instantly? And then um, you've got built-in features like a lockout time. So, you know, if you had it where somebody keeps messing around with the thing, there, on, off, on, off, on, off, it will, it would recognize if somebody's kind of playing with it and you can set it for how many times and for how long it locks that thing out. So in some of the prison applications, obviously you won't have an exposed product in the prison, but in some of the prison applications, you would have that type of thing. The guys have got nothing to do all day, so they play with the thing and then, when it's been, yeah, you know, when it's been done 10 or 20 times, this this then recognizes to shut it off, and you can set that lockdown time for however long you want. So the guy knows you do this, your water is going to be switched off for the next 12 hours or whatever. Then there's a 24-hour hygiene cycle, and what that does is if you've if it hasn't been used at all, so so like now during lockdown, nobody's been to the shopping centre for a week. You don't want to leave that stagnant water in the pipes or in the in the tap or even in the waste. So once every 24 hours, it will do an automatic once-off uh, kind of flash flow, whatever it is, whether it's on a toilet or basin. Um, and you can either uh, activate or defeat that function. Um, and I think, yeah, then there's a, uh, an on-off button, so you can temporarily switch the thing off completely. There's a reset button where you could take it all the way back to the, the factory default settings. If, you've, if you bug it around too much and you don't know where you are, you, you, you kind of reboot and start again. Uh, I think I've covered everything there. Okay, just to, to go over some of the features of the products, uh, there's obviously a massive water saving. Um, then they all the products come with a, a little strainer fitted into them already. We still suggest that you don't, you know, don't get dirt into them. But they are the water that goes in is pre-strained. The, the, the reason to uh, still have a line strainer in your general plumbing if you can is because then you don't get it blocked up at the filter within the tap. You rather do it somewhere before. But it won't get as far as the solenoid. It's it's filtered in the tap. Um, I spoke about the, the uh, auto hygiene flash and the adjustable time. Um, the temperature ranges, it, it works right through virtually freezing water all the way up to 70 degrees. And it will operate at also an extensive pressure range from 30 kPa, which is kind of almost tank fed, to 800 kPa, which is more than we would use in balanced pressure water domestic plumbing. It's also IP67 rated, so the battery boxes and that type of thing, you're not at risk of them getting wet and shorting out. Or, um, okay, we include uh, Cobra, uh, and I think that some of these uh, flow restrictors have probably changed in line with the new regulations. But we have um, what we call, what's our fancy word for it? Anyway, it's got, an, it's got an elastometer. So it would give you, regardless of your incoming pressure, you can see in that middle graph the red line. Once you hit six liters a minute, it won't go beyond that. There's also a five liter version, and I think there's even a two liter version. But what happens as, the, as that flow pressure increases, so it pushes this elastometer out, and it retains that exact flow, regardless of, of in-stream downstream pressure. So it's not a ratio of what comes in. It's a ratio of what comes in up to a point, up to six liters a minute, let's say, and then it stays at six liters a minute, whether it's a 100, 200, 400, 600 kPa system. Okay. Um, in the solenoid itself, it's also got a self-cleaning mechanism. It's got a soft closed diaphragm onto the seat so you don't get water hammer and puck noise. As I mentioned earlier, you've got that bipolar uh, solenoid system in there, so the power consumption is extremely low. They're also very neat and, and small, so you can build them into quite good looking taps as opposed to the bigger bulky things of the, the years gone by. 
and the long-term performance is is it's amazing. So Victor, um, you know, he said to me, you can really the 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 base and faucets, the the three double O twos, you can confidently get those things going because they're lost. And he's the guy who's got to send the team in to go and fix them, and in high traffic areas, you know, uh, hospitals, four ways more, uh, shopping centres. It's so really you've got quite a a proven and we've we've been doing them now for at least ten years of this of this product or eight or eight or nine years. So you've you've we we confident that they're pretty reliable. Okay, just some precautions uh, in the installation itself because sometimes you can get little hiccups and you don't really know what's going on. So some of these LED lights and um, transformers and their lighting systems. They, they also have a pulse which can interfere with what's going on in the infrared uh, beam. So if you're absolutely at your wit's end, well, if you're at your wit's end, always phone us and we'll come and help you sort it out. But uh, it can be that a particular type of light is upsetting the, the um, infrared circuit and causing it to trigger. Uh, reflective surfaces as well. We had uh, such a funny thing again. I use the Artscape job, where the, in the in the downstairs section, everything worked absolutely fine, uh, and it was one of those trough installations. We had a wall type outlet and a trough, and they had they had gone less than a three hundred mil. So by rights, they really shouldn't have worked. And then in the upstairs uh, ablutions. I think the men's were downstairs and the ladies, I can't exactly remember. These things just kept going off. And it took us a while to fathom it out, but at the bottom they had used black granite and at the top they had used white or a creamy color. And what was happening is that the black was absorbing absorbing the beam. And uh, so, so even though it was a lower than 300 mil distance, it wasn't triggering it back, whereas at the top, so you know, you can imagine the job we had trying to convince the architects that it wasn't the product problem. But uh, so surface reflection can be an issue. Um, mirrors, uh, even even like you'd see the building outside that's highly reflective. Remember that you can set that that range, activation range. So invariably, when you've got those reflective surfaces, what you've got to do is just trim the range right in. Um, it typically you would half the distance if there's a so if you've got a mirror right behind, then rather than having a 300 mil uh, activation range, take it to half of that 150 or a little bit less 140. Um, overhead light sometimes can reflect back onto a mirror and send a send a false message into the infrared eye, but invariably whatever the issues are, they can be sorted out in sight. Um, also, don't don't set the range uh, too long, because you know it ends up people start to vandalise and fiddle with the things when it doesn't um, uh, when it's too short. If you if they've got to get right underneath it to to make the thing work, they you know they start to fiddle and bang and bash. So that range setting is also really try to see what works for you. Generally, as I say, the default setting is the right one. But if you're doing a, a, an ablution block, just try each one and make sure that it works the way you'd like it to work. All right. Just quickly, they are made of DZR brass. I think you guys have probably all heard this sermon a million times, but very quickly for those who haven't. DZR brass is, a, is an alloy of two metals, copper and zinc. And where you've got dissimilar metals in an electrolyte, like our water, which has got all kinds of suspended solids in, what would typically happen is the zinc would get leached out. So the zinc would combine with the salts in the water, uh, effectively corrodes out, and it leaves the copper behind, which becomes brittle and porous. So in a DZR brass, um, they've got greater than 63% copper content, and there's a lot of additives and things in, in that alloy antimony, tin, tungsten, and so on, which tighten up the grain structure and that prevent the desinkification from happening. It's a difficult metal. It's harder. It melts at a higher temperature. It eats the tools quicker and so on. So it's not 
uh, it's not a whole lot of fun to work with. So we don't do it for fun. We do it because that's the standard that's called for and it really works. You think of our compression fittings. Uh, so just to show you that these products are most definitely DZR brass as well. Okay, and Cobra Assist, which is, as we say there, it's the home of our award-winning technical team. So what we've done, rather than just have a service department, which we've had for all the years, we've now rebranded it as Cobra Assist. And the, the idea of Cobra Assist, our in-store presence, our interface with the professionals, you guys, uh, in the plumbing trade, is that we would really like to to have a, a more direct conversation interface with the plumbers. Not that we would be selling directly to you, but we want to represent ourselves to you, tell us what you're doing, hear what you need from us, rather than rely totally through the merchant trend. Because uh, we're in a very competitive market, and I think that a lot of a lot of uh, people would have alternatives to our product, which are invariably pitched because they had a better price or, you know. So what we want to do is to have a really rebuild the relationship we've got with the plumbers. And um, we've got an extensive team. A lot of the guys are qualified plumbers themselves. And it's not like sending another plumber to your job because he's not doing it for financial gain. He's doing it absolutely to help support the products, to help you guys to, to rebuild that relationship with the plumbers. So please, in every region, contact these guys, not just on these products, but on any Lixil product. So we, we cover them all, all the brands, Grower, Cobra, Ball, the, the Libra Bars, which will now be rebranded, Cobra and so on. Any issues with any of those products, our guys will sort them. And we say award-winning because we really have. We've... Uh, I mean, I get somebody phone me with a, a service problem. I don't, I don't stress not one iota because I know I'm just going to get hold of the guy in whichever region it is, and it'll get sorted probably within 24 hours. So please take advantage of that. It costs us quite a bit to keep everybody and uh, keep them trained, get them qualified, but they they really do back and support the product. There's a lot of spares available. I've shown a couple there. So whether it's a little button or the solenoid or extended harnesses or battery boxes or infrared eyes, we've got spares of all the all this stuff uh, and and ongoing. Okay, and uh, I'm I'm getting towards the end of the talk, so I've probably gone a bit ahead of time, uh, but it's fine. We can maybe take one or two questions afterwards. So really, I appeal to you there, um, and in the questions that we asked in the beginning, we've, uh, over the years, we've lost quite significant market share to the level of competition. We acknowledge that a lot of it has been through our own ructions in the various uh, ownership changes and so on. But uh, really what we want to get back to is being a strong South African factory that make and produce, employ our South African people, and rebuild the brand and start exporting in a really big way into Africa and beyond. And we need your support, we need your input. And you know, we've taken we've never been good at cheap. We've always been good at good. And we've taken the the stance that we would rather continue to make a good quality product than try and get in the price war and, and cheapen things down. We obviously want to get more efficient. And a lot of the costing has got to do uh, with volume. So when you increase the volume, obviously you spread the fixed cost component uh, over a bigger volume of product and that part of the product cost can come down. And we are really looking to, you know, Cobra's heyday, we employed 3000 people. We're down to about 700 and uh, things like compression fittings and so on. It really, it really helps us get the, the right brass buying power, covers the fixed overheads and, so, so we appeal to you for your support. Um, these times are tough now as well. We ask that question. So right now the plants are closed because we can't, uh, obviously we're not allowed to run them, but as, as they ease up on the lockdown, things like running it on a third of the, the workforce, we, we really need to get some kind of a gauge of how much product, what type of product. So if you guys can give us some insights, we'd, we'd value that very much. Um, uh, so that when we, we get up and going, we know 
to do the right things and, and get the right supply chain going of the products which are likely to be used? Difficult question, but uh, any input is valued. And um, so, guys, thanks very much for for listening. And I hope there was something of value in there. And I think uh, that, that's it. Just if there's any questions, I'll try and give them a go. Just remind you, I'm not a technical expert, but I will most certainly, if there's something I can't answer, uh, I'll take it down and we'll get somebody back to you. Thanks a lot. Robbie, oh, we do have a few questions. I'll jump straight into it. First question says, can you just strengthen the signal because I did work in Swaziland and in the lunchroom there was a basin that went off every time a person with the reflector overall walked past it. Okay, so that that we've uh, you know kind of covered in what we said there. So he's he's addressed two things which had happened. So the reflective overall is a reflective surface, and the the range setting. If it's somebody walking past, you've got to bring that range in. Um, so it uh, again, you can definitely set that range down, bring it right in. You can bring it right tight in, and if that's a frequent problem that's happening in that particular installation, that would be the right thing to do. And if all else fails, get hold of us, and we'll we'll get to site, or we will get get somebody to fault find it with you over the phone. I don't know if that answers or helps. All right, thanks, Robbie. Your next question. Please clarify, you did touch on it regarding transformers. Should you need to change the manual to electronic products, you would need to bring in writing. Is there, is there a way to avoid damaging tiles? I think it's such a, uh, <laughs> the, the damaging tiles thing, it, it, there's, there's not a black and white answer to that for me because it depends totally on the, uh, on the circumstances. If it's an exposed product and you've got to get in behind it, you're going to have to at some point at the very least drill a hole through a tile just to even get a wire through there. But um, unless you can lift one tile and get through there. But you've to get power in from the front of the product, uh, it's not practical at all. You can't have wires lying around. So the only way on a urinal valve um, is that retrofit um, product, which as I said in the beginning, you would screw off, I don't know if you ever know, as an FJ6000 urinal flash valve. You'd switch it off, screw off the top cover, take a little uh, black piston diaphragm assembly out, and then screw on this, it's an EL3-012, I think is the number. You screw on that unit. And that then has the entire workings in there. And that's the only, only way around that. But um, yeah, other than that, uh, no, I don't think you can, you can't bring power from the front. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Robbie. Next question. This is quite long. <clears throat> Apex products were mentioned <coughs> at the school, but not discussed but would like to mention, we started using Apex vacuum breakers instead of a popular brand in January, February, but just about every third key installation, the Apex vacuum breakers were faulty or leaking. We had to return many back to suppliers. We then switched back to the original brand. Have you had many Apex vacuum breakers being sent back? Has there been any recent changes to those products? Yes, so thank you for that question and uh, and uh, apologies from our side on some of the quality issues we had on Apex. So you're 100% right. In the last, uh, so I would say from uh, January, February, we've had some quality issues on Apex vacuum breakers and in fact on valves. So just so that you know the background to Apex, Apex is a New Zealand uh, company um, and we have the license to manufacture Apex products here in South Africa so so Apex is um, you know and that was part of what Dawn had when when Lixel took over so we've taken over that agreement and part of the manufacturing we were doing our plant in Krugersdorp and part of it was done in in a joint venture plant we have in Swaziland called Exipro and 
the issue that we'd had is that uh, some of those bodies and things were changed in Exipro. And uh, we, when we started getting, a, um, you know, from Victor's guys, the feedback of the service calls around Apex valves and vacuum started going haywire, we went and had a look. And so there had been alterations to the drawing. So we've directly addressed that. I've personally got involved with, uh, with the guys in Swaziland. And yes, we are fielding lots of service calls in the field, but but the correction back to the original drawing has been done. So going forward, you'll get back to the product uh, as you knew it. And I apologize for that. And where we have service issues, let's go and sort them out. We've, you know, what else can we do? Okay. Uh, thanks, Robbie. Yeah, that's it for our questions. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add in closing? Um, no, just to say uh, thanks very much to yourself for putting the thing together, Brendan and the, the OPSA guy, and uh, for f doing this. And depending how long lockdown goes on, maybe there's other topics that we can do going forward. And uh, for all those that attended and listened, thanks very much. Really appreciate you giving the time. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, thanks for a very informative session. And uh, thank you to our attendees for joining us. Um, just before we end off, um, I just quickly want to share a poll just for the attendees. It's just regarding these lockdown webinar sessions. So the poll is up now. It says, would you like to continue with the lockdown training sessions during level four lockdown? And then the options are, yes, please, only one per day, no thank you, and I am indifferent. So if you wouldn't mind just... Uh, Oh, just giving a bit of feedback here um, just to see how we can uh, move on into level four of lockdown. All right, so just select any one of those options. I'm going to keep it open another 15 seconds, so please just uh, yeah, just choose one of the options. Um, while you, you guys are choosing, just a reminder, um, the server after this is also just three really quick questions. I urge you to please fill that in for us. And uh, yeah, thank you for doing the poll. I'm going to close it now. And there we go. That's it from our side. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Robbie, for presenting. And uh, we'll see you again soon. All right. All Enjoy right. Your day. Thanks a lot. Bye.